my name is Jonas. I invited Kelly to speak today. Um, Kelly founded uh, San Francisco CrossFit about five years ago uh, with his wife, Juliet, who's also in the audience. Thanks for coming. And um, I think sometime last year, Kelly started with his mobility project, and uh, he was basically posting a uh, YouTube vi uh, video on uh, mobility uh, per day for a whole full year. You're at about 270 right now, I think. And um, for me, uh, that really showed what you can do with a little bit of knowledge, good intentions, a camera, and an internet connection. So I've been watching a lot of those videos. Uh, I work at YouTube, so I've been looking for things to uh, watch at night. And uh, so the videos were super helpful. Thanks uh, for posting all that. And um, I thought Kelly would be a great fit for our health at Google Speaker Series. And uh, why didn't you come up to the stage and uh, teach us how to use the time in the office for our bodies uh, rather than against it? Thanks for coming. Uh, first, thanks for coming on your lunch. I appreciate it. My name is Kelly Starrett. I'm a clinical doctor of physical therapy. Uh, I own a strength and conditioning center in San Francisco with my wife. And uh, Jonas was referring to the fact that about a, uh, we, we see lots of athletes and we specialize in the gamut from children all the way up to the most elite, scary powerlifter you can see. So we see have, we have lots and lots of athletes come through, lots and lots of people come through. Um, in the last six years, we maybe estimate we've seen 60,000 kind of athlete sessions at our gym, which is a lot of pattern recognition. You know, so first and foremost, I'm a strength and conditioning coach, but I'm also a physical therapist. And what I was seeing was that I was running into the same patterns and the same problems over and over again. And people were running, you know, sitting at their desk, doing their due diligence, eating right, trying to exercise like mad. And we were finding that people were making the kind of same errors and same type one mistakes over and over again. And I'd see a lot of people would come and talk to us about their back pain or their, their knee pain or their ankle stuff. You know, they injured themselves in college, whatever. And uh, they were coming to see me after having an MRI, seeing a, getting a physician's, you know, referral for physio. And there were very simple things that we were, they could have done. They didn't need that. that there, there should have been some basic information that, you know, your grandma should have passed down to you. That, you know, your mom said, said, oh, you have knee pain? Why don't you do this? This is your granddad's, you know, favorite knee squat test, you know, stretch your quad kind of thing. So what happened was that we started a project that we were going to be committed to changing the way that people thought about taking care of themselves, that they should be able to perform basic maintenance on themselves. And one of the crucial factors is kind of examining and bringing consciousness to how it is you sit, what are your normal patterns every day. I'll tell you that sitting in a chair and talking about sitting and sitting at a desk is probably the most dry, horrific topic on the planet. And uh, it's much akin to talking about the differences in toilet paper. Come on. What I want you guys to know is that if you're here and learn some very few basic organizing principles and understanding about how your body works, you'll be able to apply it everywhere. And you can take this time sitting at your desk and you can actually use it as a launch pad to get a lot of work done so that your time off the desk is not influenced by the time on the desk. And that's kind of the, the underlying principle where we're going. I want to make sure we have time to answer individual questions, but uh, we have a lot to get going through. My wife always reminds me that I speak quickly and I get excited sometimes. So if I start to haul, uh, but a little bit, slow me down, stop me, and we'll, uh, we'll make sure you understand the concepts, okay? All right. So, again, our central premise is that you should know this. This should be free information. Your basic understanding of how you work and how you sit should not be kind of happenstance. You should arrive at a, a system of, or of movement. And some of you were elite level gymnasts, I can tell, as kids. And some of you were in karate. Some of you were obviously high level fighter pilots. You're tipped back in your chair the same amount that they actually tip fighter jets uh, for the fighter pilots back. Because they, they didn't know how to teach airplane pilots and fighter jet pilots how to protect their back, so they just tip the seat back. And that's one of the ways that you can naturally get out of that position. We can see it. We start judging our athletes immediately when they come in the door. Um, so if we start to have some basic concepts, some understanding, we can get rolling. And what I want to show you that is that in the news recently, um, in every dirty men's fitness journal, men's fitness, men's health, they're talking about it and trying to scare you that you know sitting is going to kill you. And I'll tell you that um, that is the worst, worst way to get my attention. And I'll tell you an example why. How many people in here flossed this morning? Raise your hands. 
Right, yet you all know you should floss religiously. And the problem is, if you don't floss, what's going to happen? Not flossing is like not wiping, one of our friends says, but that's an aside, right? The issue here is that you aren't flossing, and you know you may or may not lose your teeth in the long haul, but tomorrow you'll wake up and you'll still have your teeth, and flossing didn't improve your life. You did not see any direct kind of improvement based on the flossing. You couldn't feel change, you didn't wake up feeling supple, you didn't, you know, PR on your 5K, and that's the problem when we try to, you know, make things kind of germane to people relative to, hey, do this or else, sit in your chair or else. You're like, dude, I'm a world champion. I sit in my chair all day long, and then I go, you know, rock the kickball league, and it doesn't doesn't affect me. So what we want to do is try to tie more uh, kind of the behaviors of why we should be doing things into things that we can change and things that we can see. And that flossing scare model is a is a is a bad model. So let's move on. What we want to do is start thinking about sitting as a skill. And it's a high skill activity. In fact, if you look at yoga and you look at the the Buddha and how these people are sitting, they've spent a whole kind of millions and thousands of years organizing themselves to be able to sit effectively. And Buckminster Fuller, um, great thinker, talked about that all systems that are true and organized are kind of mutually accommodating. And that once you start to understand and see the kind of some basic organizing principles that, to which you're kind of falling to every day and maybe not paying attention, you'll be shocked when the veil of illusion comes away from your eyes and you're sitting like the Buddha all day long at Google, which is really the dream. You start sitting at an early age for some reason, and did your mom ever teach you how to sit? No. Did we teach our kids how to sit at school? No, it's, it's one of those assumptions. Well, you're sitting, you're sitting fine, everyone can sit, but yet it's probably the highest skill, highest demand thing that we do. Um, this is my daughter's friend is sitting in the chair, and my daughter is wisely sitting on the ground. Just, we'll put that out. So we go from sitting at an early age to suddenly this very complex minutia of, hey, I have the right thing and this angle at my knee. And what I want to show you is that that's great. You can sit in this position and you have the computer right, but look at how many 90 degree angles are in that human being. Can you see that? If you're in an idealized state of sitting at a computer, according to our ergo brothers and sisters, you have one at the ankle, one at the knee, one at the hip, one at the elbow, and you spend a nice chunk of your day stuck in 90 degrees, because that's what we say is the best way to go. So imagine you and I are having lunch at the most famous cafeteria in the whole world, and you notice that I can only bend my arm halfway to my face. That would be a little strange, because eventually I'd start complaining of neck pain, wrist pain, but imagine if I spent 10 hours a day or longer stuck with 90 degree angles in my body. Suddenly you might just see like, hey, what are you doing, Kelly? Well, I'm practicing eating for lunch. It's gonna be fine. And what happens is a lot of times is that we see this kind of slow decay, slow kind of transformation of the body to reflect the reality that we do every day. We like to say that muscles and tissues are like obedient dogs, and your body will respond in kind all day long. All you have to do is practice. So if you want to sit in 90 degree angles, easy. So where do we go from there? I'm going to show you a little quick video of an athlete who is a very, very strong power athlete. I want you to notice that she's working full ranges of motion. There's often times we see that people literally will not bend their legs past 90 degrees for an entire day. They wake up, they get off the bed, they sit on the loo, they go to have breakfast, they go to work, they're in their car, and that leg has never bent more than 90 degrees the whole day. And yet you're designed to be a moving machine. You're an elegant moving machine. So here's an, here's an athlete um, squatting, going for a one rep max back squat. It's a very technical move. She's using this west side style approach. What I want you to notice is the full range of motion. And I want you to notice that her knees go out when she stands up, okay? This is Caroline Starrett, my other daughter at age 11 months. At some point, we stop thinking about why do we move the way we move? You know, you're gonna notice that she's gonna squat all the way down to the grass, butt to grass squat here. Perfect positioning, shin is vertical, minimizing shear across the knee, et cetera, et cetera. Watch this. Perfect squat up. That was the paleo chair, by the way, all the way down. If you don't have a chair, the, the uh, Star Act girls are so advanced athletes that they squat and eat at the same time. It's really the next evolution of working and moving. And then she's sitting down on that, that chair. But what's happening is that she's, you know, by default, sitting, getting up and down, up off the ground. In cultures that even sleep in toilet on the ground, we see a lot less hip disease. We see a lot less back disease. Which is why? Because we use it. We use those ranges of motion. So 
The question is, what's happening? And I want you guys to do a quick test for me. If you, some of you guys are eating, don't worry about it, but if you can, I want you guys just to stand up for me real quick. You need to experience it to really understand. All right, here's what we're gonna do. I want you to stick your hands in your pockets and grab this big chunk, bend over and grab this big chunk of skin here. It's like chicken skin. That's the crackling of the human being right there. Got it? Okay, you got it. It's not sexy. Grab it. Grab hold. You're not, it's not your shirt. It's your skin. Got a big handful of it? Okay, now this represents about a 90 degree angle in your body. Got it? Now go ahead and stand up. Hold that skin. Do not let that skin go. What happens to your back? How does that feel? It's awesome. Right? You overextend. Can you feel you're tight in the hips? And you've had to make a compromise based on the fact that your hips are tight. Can you guys feel that? If you reach, grab that skin and then try it out, you're either going to tear the skin off your legs. Don't do that. Or you're going to have to make some compromise. Well, this is what happens to us after we sit for in a short period of time. Your body instantaneously reflects what's going on underneath. Now, what's interesting is that a lot of our athletes have, and, and, and Google uh, people I've here have switched to a standing desk which is fantastic, but yet still has its own kind of unique set of problems. And if I stand all day long in a bad position, it's the same thing as sitting all day long in a bad position. In fact, you'll see very, very sophisticated yoga enlightened people stand and they put one leg up. And what are they doing? They're trying to figure out a way not to have their backs hurt. And if you've ever gone drinking at a bar, you've noticed that they have that bar at the bottom of the bar, Captain Morgan position, right? What that's about so that we can make it easier to stand up. And you'll see kind of examples of like this all the time. But what's really happening when you picked up that hip is that you were playing what we call gasso breco. Your body has the capacity to generate lots of force, run away from bears instantaneously. They, you, know, you, you have a model that can generate lots of force over lots of periods of time very quickly in spite of your tight hips. And so by the time we've actually worn out a joint or caused some pain, it's because you've been running around with your handbrake. And gasso breco is a game that we used to play um, when we would travel uh, in rental cars on the national team. And what we would do is basically turn the car on and floor the gas pedal all the time because, of course, that's what it's there for, the gas, right foot. So you turn the car on, you floor the gas pedal, but you can't drive 90 miles an hour all the time, so you put your foot on the brake at the same time. So the car's revving to 8,000 RPMs, and you've got your foot on the brake. Can you see how that works? And then you just accelerate and decelerate with the brake. We work with the military. They told me that's called tactical driving, but when we did it, we called it gas obreco. So you play gas obreco till you think you're going to die or the car's going to blow up. We pulled into the hotel in South America, Team USA. We get out, and the young, nice man was there. He's like, senor, senor. And we're like, no, no, it's okay. We're Team USA. We're here. And he was like, no, no, senor, senor. And we're like, no, really, we're checking in for the world championships. We're here. And he's like, your wheel is on fire, senor. <laughs> and we had literally set the tire on fire. And, uh, you know, of course, we were so shocked. How could that possibly happen? I have no idea. Well, we were running around with our Ferrari engines, right, of that rental car with the brake on. And that's what's happening to a lot of our athletes. We sit down, and as unbeknownst to us, that handbrake starts to come up a little bit, and we start playing gas or So we're going to show you how to, how to ameliorate that. And the model is simple. It's movement and mobility. You know, we want you to think about, you have to know how to organize and how to get moved, how to move correctly, and it's very simple. And at the same time, you have to treat, be able to treat yourself. So here's, that's our model, movement and mobility. First thing in the movement we'll take off is get organized, spine and limbs. So here's what I want to show you. I'm going to show you guys the two-hand rule first. So what I want you to do is sit up tall. And take, take a look at the difference. Every single person in this room is now going to sit up, right? So you caught yourself in what we call an open circuit position, where literally you're hanging on your spine, you're slightly flexed, or you're over there in the back and you're just ramrod straight like your mom told you, and you're also in an overextended, non-supported position. So the two-hand rule is that if you take your sternum, actually come stand up for me, it'll be even easier. If you find your sternum right here, it's the bottom of your rib cage, that's where you're not, that's your xiphoid process, don't do CPR there, right? You remember that? Make a flat hand. Take your other hand and put it on your pubic bone. Now, Check this out. Make your belly as tight as you can and squeeze your butt as hard as you can with your feet straight. Get that tight. So if someone walked up and punched you in the stomach, you would laugh, right? No problem. Here, I'm going to go. I'll show you what I'm talking about. <laughs> right. So you're nice and tight. That is neutral spine. If your butt is squeezed and your abs are on, that is straight up and down, balanced and supported. You're braced. Now, you can't walk around flexing your cobra hood all the time because it's weird, right? Walk up. Well, good morning. How are you? I'm stable, braced. What we need to do, though, is think you've got to have 20% of that best effort on all the time. So if you just give me, squeeze your butt 
belly tight 20%, you'll notice that you found yourself in a good position. Now, if you go to sit down and your hands, keep your hands there, if your hands go apart, that's a fault. That's a spi broken spinal position. Or if you're sitting in the chair and your hands start coming together, you're ending up in the dreaded dog poop position, right? Same thing. <laughs> dreaded spine, flexion, herniation, danger. No, it's not that. It just looks bad. So go ahead and see if you can hold that neutral spine for me with that 20% of your abs and sit down and pay attention. So now, as you sit down, now you have some baseline. And it's easy to find that organized position standing. And that's one of the reasons we like to have our athletes and, and, and office our executive athletes stand because it's really easy to be in this organized position. As soon as I sit down, oh, my athlete capsules, my, my tight jeans are all pulling me into a bad position. And I have to overcome that. So if I get organized in a standing position, it's easier and it's easier to see. And you can see that many of us were like, that was an awesome demo. And then I'm, hands are basically touching each other. So the first error is that it doesn't matter what you're doing with your keyboard or how high your desk is or where your mouse is, if your back is trashed and you're hanging out on your joints all day long, it's no good. And one of the things that we'll see is that from a kind of a chi standpoint or a neurological outflow efficiency, when we see changes in spinal positioning that happen like this or at the neck and head, it radically affects your power output and radically affects your actually your reaction time, your neural output. Let me show you. Can you come up here, Jonas? Yeah. And I'll have you, can I have you hold, uh, I'll have you hold the microphone. Come on. So I'm going to show you, these little head positions make a difference. Now you're all sitting up, you have a nice model. You should always have your abs on 20%. You don't ever get to go on vacation unless you're sleeping. Always 20%. Now here's the deal. I'm going to have Jonas put his hand out towards the wall in the back, and he's going to spread his fingers out. And spreading his fingers out is the same thing as making his elbow stiff. And so now his elbow is stiff, and now he's braced. And now keep your eyes up, and I'm going to try to bend him. Don't let me move you, okay? Hold. Hold. He's very strong. Okay, I can't do it. He's German. Okay. Now, when I have him look down, watch what happens instantaneously to his positioning. So all he's going to do is just look at the f floor a little bit, because you can't relate to that at all on the computer, okay? Arm out. Hold. Now look up. Hold. Don't we move you. And look down. And he breaks right away. Whoa. It's, it's weird, like magic. The same thing will happen if he looks up. So if he's sitting in a bad position, either way, if we see a deviation in neck or spine, we'll see the same break. And just look up. Oh, even if he looks up a little bit, we see that. Thank you. Big change in output. And that's why we need to pay attention to kind of what's going on. Do I have a brace model? Do I have 20% of my trunk on all the time? So I'm going to walk around and just, you know, be able to punch my coworkers 20% as my best effort in their stomach all the time. They appreciate that. And then actually in our family, we call it the belly smack. And our daughter at her gymnastics class is how they teach the kids. They just give them a little smack in the belly and they figure it out, 20%. Okay, so you've got that, that model in your head now. You've got to not violate the two-hand rule. You can't extend. You can't flex. You've got to have on up. See, did it again. Easy to figure out. right? Big landmarks. And ultimately, you become a fence post, which is the highest degree of zen you can achieve. Now, the second part to understanding this, first I said first trunk, then limbs. So the main thing that we need to talk about are what shoulders and the hips. These are the real I issues for our bodies as we sit. If I'm disorganized at the trunk and hip, or at the trunk, I can't, it doesn't really matter what's going on with my shoulder. I can't ever fix this problem in my elbow or my wrist because I'm disorganized here. So now I've got a plan here. I'm straight up and down and braced. Now I need to show you a very complex biomechanical principle called flexion and external rotation. I know you guys were all superstars and you were like, biomechanics was a sleeper class. But look, this is flexion in the arm. Arm comes straight up. See how simple that is? Brushing your teeth, being a human being, most of those movements happen in flexion. Easy. External rotation is just turning the arm out, turning the hand up. That's external rotation. So flexion and external rotation. Simple. Let me give you a few examples. It's really important. Flexion and external rotation is how gymnasts turn out on the gymnastics rings. Right? Can you see it? So they're turned out. And what's, what's important about flexion and external rotation is that's where the shoulder becomes stable. That's where the hip becomes stable. And then I've wound up that joint into a good tight position, and then I can hang out there all day long with very little muscular problem, very little kind of tissue deviation, tissue creep, and it gives me an organized position to start with. And what you'll find is that you'll see this over and over again in nature. Shavasana, or corpse pose, looks a lot like, what's her hand doing? 
It's an external rotation. It's the same as the gymnastics rings position. It's the same as the anatomical position. A screwdriver. If you want to tighten a screw, which way does the screw turn? It's always set up for right-handed people. I know there's a right-handed bias in the world. But it's external rotation is how you tighten the screw and drive the screw in. You'll see these patterns. Even if you turn your car key on, how does your car start in the morning? External rotation. There it is again. We're having a little yellow out. There we go. More importantly, because you're probably of my generation, Mr. Miyagi taught Danyo-san and the Karate Kid what movement? Wax on, wax off. And what is wax on, wax off? Really just about external rotation and flexion. So if you understand that you're going to see these strong principles over and over again, in fact, if we're in a self-defense class and you grab my hand, the, you know, grab my wrist like you're holding me, I'm danger, right? I don't know how you got my hand in the first place, but you've got it now. I'm going to break it. And how do they teach us first? External rotation. And it's a very strong, powerful position. And it organizes the shoulders. So if you're sitting at your desk, the very first thing you can do to get organized at the shoulder is that external rotation. And all you need to do is just screw your arm around to the back of the sock. Can you do that? Try that. So look, you're just sitting in Shavasana at your desk. Enlightened beings. Now take a look at this. I uh, was an avatar nerd like everyone else, and I really bought into the unobtainium movement and understood all this until I saw this. Does anyone understand what's wrong with this photo? I was like, after this, I was like, James Cameron is so unrealistic. He did not pay attention to any of the details. Because, yeah, what position is that person drawing the boat, the Navi? She is in internal rotation. No advanced human being life force would ever draw a bow in a weak position. And so if the hand was on the other side, I would have bought the movie. But the fault is the person is internally rotated, which is the same position that you were not supposed to type in, the same position that causes all this not good positioning and looks really, really bad. So you can see this is a break. So let's show you something. This is probably the most critical part of the whole talk is what I call the Western keyboard approach. This is our friend Mark Bell. He's benching 900 pounds. He's going for the world record. I think it's uh, crazy, but he's a good friend. The first thing he does, so put your arms out. I'm going to teach you how to bench press like Mark Bell. 900 pounds is coming. Set your shoulders back, OK? And I want you to pretend like you're going to break an imaginary bar or stick in half, 45 degrees. What happened when we did that? External rotation. See how your shoulder got stable? Now, get tight, belly's tight, two-hand rule. Now pull your elbows down to the side, ready to go. You're bench pressing, it's very heavy. And that's your keyboard position. Ah, hey, that's a Western approach. So if I actually rotate, yeah, pull it down, get tight, and then type. Then guess where my mouse should go? External rotation. There's that same principle, that if I'm internally rotating from a mouse, my shoulder is disorganized, and I'm going to have problems. So you know, we teach people how to get all this good, fancy setup, but we don't ever teach them how to sit and what positions they should be in. Question? Oh, the problem with the earlier slide was that her hand is not in an externally rotated position. The hand is in an internally rotated position, which means the shoulder is in a weakened, impinged state. It's a disorganized position. All you need to do is just wax off, and then you, that's how you would do it, right? That's easy to see. Good question. We do the biomechanics. OK, so that's our Western approach. Now, because we're so much more zen than Mark Bell, I'm going to show you guys an Eastern keyboard approach. So here's what I want you to do. Go ahead and actually rotate the arms like you're going to back. And you know that they probably told you to squeeze your shoulder blades together. And that never works because the shoulder blade is never organized in a wound up tight position. So actually rotate. Now you're tight. OK, so now you're in Shavasana. Boom. And then just flip your hands over. What position are you now? Perfect typing position. And you can find it either way, from either from this external rotate position down, or you just flip over and turn it back up. Now, I'll tell you what, this is probably the easiest way to understand and hold a good texting machine. So pull out your, your texting machine, whatever that is, your texting machine of choice. This is important, because then you're like, oh, I'm so, I'm so good at work all day long, and then you're like, ooh, text. And you default right back into your little monkey habit, OK? So here's what I want you to do. I want you to hold your texting machine with one hand, balance it on your hand, actually rotate, belly's tight, two hand rule engaged, and then just pull it in tight, and then place your other hand underneath. And now, your shoulders are supported, and you will be shocked that your typing rate will go up, your number of texts answered per minute will go up, and your shoulders will not ache. And you see, as soon as you let those shoulders go, your shoulders round forward, your head goes, it's terrible, isn't it? So you just, like, you're like what are you doing? You're like, I'm getting ready to meditate. 
with my texting machine. And I'll tell you, it also solves a horrible thumb problem that we see in a lot of people who have to be on, on little Blackberries all day long. So if you can actually rotate that hand first and then bring it in, we've solved it. And so much of this, you'll notice that uh, this pattern happens. And this person, this is the, 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 um, the Bodhisattva who basically wrote the yoga movement. And what position is lotus, external rotation? Right? In fact, sitting Indian style, this is actually the only appropriate use of Indian style, everyone else is indigenous person style, but this is Indian style, is that the leg is actually rotated in inflection, which is the same position as the, as the upper body. So you'll see these patterns over and over again, and you'll, you'll be kind of mini obsessed with it. Um, when we saw George, Caroline squat earlier, the bear, she squatted and her knees went out. And that same knee out position is that external rotation position which stabilizes her hips. So we're going to see the same model at the hip and at the shoulder. All right, so we have some kind of basic understanding of, hey, I've got to get my spine organized. Two-handed rule, 20%, flexion, external rotation. And then from there, you can basically go to the Olympics, do whatever you want. It's super easy. So next piece then, I said it's a movement and a mobility approach. Well, the first part of that is that we say, hey, is the athlete in a good position? Is the person sitting at the desk in a good position? And then the second part is, What's going on with the tissues? And here's that piece where we usually skip around. And if I, it doesn't matter how much massage you get or stretching you do, if you just default back to your troglodyte self, it's amazing how you go back to that space. So we have to fix the position, then we fix the tissues. And now we've got a recipe for changing things. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to take a little test for me right now. This is the, the dirty secret show. I want you to pull your pant leg up, or cross your leg, pull your pant up so you can see your shin. This is a technical part. This is your leg bone right here. So grab the calf behind the leg bone and the front. And what you're going to do is you're going to see there's a flat part of that middle of that shaft of that tibia, right in the front of the leg there in the shin. See there's a big flat part in your shin? It's flat there. What I want you to do is take your thumb and drive it right into the flesh, not on your calf, the muscle, but right over the bone. And try to push that thumb into the bone. Five seconds hard. So right on the bone, push hard into the bone. Hard, hard, hard. You're not pushing hard. I can tell. Get tight. Good. Now, pop your thumb up. Did you see a dent in your skin? Is there a little dent there? Raise your hand if you have a dent. You, don't be ashamed. I know that there's a global warming problem going on. This is what we call global dehydration. And what that little hitting edema test is, is it's a metric of how well your tissues are sliding over one another. And guess what? If your tissues become pitted and nasty... And, and, and you're dehydrated, then what ends up happening is you go through a very complex process where high temperature, let's, let's take another model. Imagine right now, I weigh, I'm a, I'm a 200 pound guy, I'm a little more than that, I'm an adult sized male, 200 pounds, and I'm about 100 degrees, give or take. Right now I have about 100 degrees and 100 pounds in each one of my butt cheeks, just like you. And guess what? Under high pressure and high temperature, you create lamination or oil. That's how we laminate surfaces together, right? So what's going on right now is you are in the complex process of creating what we call butt lamination. All of the tissues of your butt and hamstrings are being sandwiched together under high pressure for what? Seven, eight, nine, ten hours a day, plus the car ride, plus, and you can imagine that if you also failed that dehydration test, you don't have any lubrication. You had to take a drink of water. You couldn't even help it. You're so thirsty. And what's happening is that you're getting those tissues stuck together. And for lack of a better word, you've created, you know, the sandwich out of those, all, all of your posterior bits. Well, that's happening in all of your tissues. Your Achilles, the nerves sliding through the nerve beds, how the tendons relate, all of these tissues end up getting sticky and be, they don't slide very well and then they get stiff. And that stiffness is one of the problems that happens. And so if I'm dehydrated and then I freeze myself in a 90 degree position, you can imagine that after a while, that's going to be a recipe for being, I don't know what's happening, but I used to be a college swimmer and now I can't put my arms over my head. And it turns out, what? You need water and salt. And what are the, the, what are the amounts of water? Well, we recommend that people drink half their body weight in ounces. That's it, every day. And what I think you should do, so do the high math there. I know you can do it. It's very simple. It's not a lot of water. You should, here's the should, try to do all that work. It's one of the ways that we can game this process is that I can take care of my hydration at work so I can use my coffee in the morning, bridge myself to work, I drink all day long, and then I go home and I have, you know, red wine. And uh, neither of those things count towards our total water, but what does count is the water that you're drinking during the day. So baseline, without exercise, half your body weight in ounces every day. Now, the, the key to this is that a lot of you drink more than that, 
You're really good. You've got your little gallon. You're refilling your thing. But it turns out that you're not adding any salt. And a lot of the people we're seeing now are paying a lot more attention to their diet. They're very low salt diets. They're eating primal, gluten-free. And what's happening is that people are not salting anything, and they've reinvented the need for the salt trade. Well, it turns out animals drink ferociously after they eat. And the reason is that's when they absorb water. And if you're not regularly going home and eating animal kidneys, which you're probably not, then you need to think about your water as a chance to make it with a little salt in it so it's the same salinity as your body, you can actually absorb it. So what ends up happening is you dose your kidneys, you get this big bolus of water, you're so good, and then you just tinkle all the time. And that doesn't change any of the global dehydration. And this global dehydration, this change in that quality of that stickiness of those tissues, it takes weeks to develop and it takes weeks to undo. So what I'm saying is, take a little pinch of sea salt, throw in your water. or um, there are nice companies in the world that make these great little tablets that you can just drop into your bottle. And Camelback gave us some of these. Um, doesn't matter what brand you use. They're just, there's Noon. There's, uh, everyone makes these little tablet electrolytes. They're not sugar. It's not Gatorade. It won't wreck your insulin, but it makes the water absorbable. So make sure you're not making that type 1 error, that foundational error being dehydrated, and you're drinking all the water, but you're not absorbing the water. Because if we can undo that stickiness of that tissues, things change radically. And what happens is you become delaminated. Or we want to delaminate you, but this is your tissue. You become stuck. And I, I like the bacon because it's a nice reference for your muscles running through the grilled cheese sandwich that is your butt, right? You should be like layers of silk running over steel springs, not this. And if you stand up and then go try to run or play kickball after this, you're going to have a problem. So what do you do about that? So the first and easiest way to deal with that is we brought you a gift. We need to hand some of these back. This is a lacrosse ball. Maybe we can get a couple people to pa pass these around. These lacrosse balls cost a buck a shot. There's lots and lots of fancy myofascial balls. Come on, we can hand some out. Thanks, Jonas. We like the lacrosse ball because we think it's the most painful, first. And second, it turns out they're cheap. And if you're, someone wants to steal it or take it, we give it to them. So here's what I want you to do. Very, very complex task. Take the lacrosse ball and stick it in the grilled cheese sandwich that is your bottom. Hey, I can do this while I'm answering emails, right? And what's happened is now you've gotten some work done while you're doing something else. So grab that lacrosse ball. We've got plenty. We've got more in the back. Don't be shy. There's a box of lacrosse balls in the back. We're trying to change the world one lacrosse ball at a time. Here's what I want you to do. So I want you to stick on, sit on that lacrosse ball until you find something that hurts. It's pretty simple. I wish it was more technical and complex than this. I have an advanced doctoral degree, and that's all about sticking a lacrosse ball on your bum. Okay? Got it. Now, you find something that hurts. Now, if you stick a nail through that grilled cheese sandwich, are you going to have a problem? Yeah, it's going to hurt, right? And it doesn't change the surface. It doesn't delaminate or shear those tissues apart. So if you want to pull a grilled cheese sandwich apart, what do you need to do? Kind of spread it apart, right? You don't just stick a nail through it. So what you're doing right now is just sticking a nail through your laminated surfaces, and that's why it hurts. So what you need to do is roll. So first thing is just try to roll past that lacrosse ball anywhere that it hurts. And if it doesn't hurt, find some place that does. It's a dirty secret in there. Many of you guys have been experts at sitting in front of a blue screen for many, many years, and, and it takes a while to undo that lamination. So what I'm saying is, how long does it, how long does it take? Treat until you make change. How simple is that? Now, that's one model. Roll around on it. Here's the other model. Go ahead and put it underneath your hamstring, which is this big muscle group in the back of your leg. So kind of tack it down. So now we're back to that tack model, and what we're going to do is we're going to do what we call an active tack and stretch. It's a poor person's ART. I know you guys are working hard for the man, right? So you don't have time to you know, go get massages. So put the ball on your hamstring and then kick your leg out. Wah! Anyone feel that? That's fun, huh? That's a pain face. That's a private face. Don't make that face. Straighten your leg. Now just kick your leg back and forth. And what's happening is that you've created a little micro tack under that hamstring, under those posterior tissues, whatever that tissue is there, and now you're starting to delaminate. You're restoring that slidability. And I'll, I'll challenge you this afternoon. Go ahead and hammer one butt cheek, then only floss one hamstring back and forth. We call this flossing, right? This kind of tack and stretch. And just move it around, you know, give it five or ten minutes. It doesn't take much time. And then stand up. And just move around and try to squeeze your butt, and you're going to be like one side is like the Hulk, and the other side is like a grilled cheese sandwich. And that's how we know it works. And it's very, very simple and very low tech. And, you know, you, someone's like, can I borrow you the crossbow? And you're like, sure. You know, it's a buck. Like, please, a latte costs more than you, you know, treating yourself. So please take that lacrosse ball. Enjoy that. So that's one model. 
The second thing is we want you to think, start thinking about gaming your desk. Um, I stopped evolving after the Atari 2600 when I moved back home from Germany. So this is my mantra. But one of the things that we do is we try to drink all the water we can while we work, use the lacrosse ball in as many tissues as we can. Now, think through this. is some advanced clinical reasoning. Could you put that lacrosse ball on the bottom of your foot? Yes. Can you put that lacrosse ball in your knotted arm? Yes. Take the lacrosse ball right now, put it over your heart. Yeah, that's your pec and pec minor. Get stick and ropey in there and holds you forward. Your body's like, this is the position you, you want to be in, bro. I got your back. And so it rolls you forward, pins you down, and all you have to do is roll that thing around right underneath your collarbone. You can find those sticky bits, yeah? It's super simple. If you think, hey, no one needs to know under the desk what's going on. How's it going? And all you're doing is just rolling on your feet. And uh, if you're a runner or you stand up or plan on running or cycling, we do not take care of our feet. It's a simple way to get some serious mileage in uh, while you're at work. And someone just texted me and said, hey, Cal, big fan. Um, I just was at uh, jury duty for three hours, and I got it all done. So, you know, carry your lacrosse ball. The lacrosse ball we know has gone to Afghanistan. We know it's being deployed with our Navy SEALs. And uh, it's very, very simple. And it's a low-tech way to actually change the interface of these muscles, the skin, and the tissue. But now we're into the executive stretches. Let me just show you a couple ideas. On the end of this presentation, there are some links with ideas, with some directions. So I'm not going to run you through a whole gamut. But there's ideas and short little episodes that you can immediately click to. But let's do a little game. Imagine that you're sitting at your desk now. Go ahead and stand up for me. Oh, you failed. First time you sit up, right, that means you owe a penalty. So here's the first game, and we call it the sit game, or, or what do we say, um, kind of sit and pay. So every time you get up and down, that's one penalty. So here's the first and easiest thing you can do. Cross your leg. Belly tight. Don't violate that two-hand rule. Now, if you're having a hard time getting up or your knees and your chest, already some things are, should be becoming clear to you. It's easy. It should be easy to get my leg down and tall. Right? If your knee is up by your face, that's not good. There you go, down. You can't, right? So go ahead and just lean forward. Now, the, 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 the common mistake that people make is that they just don't do things long enough to make change. So the minimum therapeutic dose is two minutes. It's easy to remember. Give me two, right? From Johnny Utah, you can see all the, the submarine sandwiches. Back in two and two. Two minutes is a nice way, but more, more important is that you just start to do something. And right now, you can hook your knee underneath your desk, get some email change, take your lacrosse ball, stick it right behind the calf bone right there. Oh, hey, look at that. Right behind that shin bone, press that ball with both hands right into that fleshy bit. Now make circles with your ankles. Hey, that's okay. You got it? I'll take that. Thank you. So right there, anchor that thing, and then just make little circles, little wheels. You know, my wife is a world champion athlete back there and an attorney, and she's like, I'm always going to wear cute shoes, Kelly, no matter what you say. And those cute shoes make her calves tight. And here's that remedy. I'm like, here's the compromise. You can wear cute shoes, but do something for your feet, please. And, uh, you know, that, this is so simple. So, hey, a penalty, every time I got up, shink, I have to do something for a minute. Simple? Gives you an idea, okay? Go ahead and stand up one more inch again. Go ahead, do it. Hit it. Oh, that's a foul. Good. Next foul. Watch how high-tech this is. Put your knee on the ground. Can you do that right in front of your desk? Right in front of your chair here? Go ahead. If you've got arthritic, arthritic knees, don't do it. Be cool. If it feels sketchy, it's sketchy, right? How simple is that model? Now, squeeze your bum as hard as you can. Did, was your bum squeezed? It wasn't, wasn't it? You were like all over extended man belly guy, right? Don't be that guy. Rib cage down, squeeze your butt, and just push forward. Now, through that butt. Anyone feeling anything tight, like a wolverine gnawing out your hip right here? Yeah, that's another way to undo that hip skin mobe, that, that tightness. And all you have to do right now is just answer emails in a very strange position for, <laughs> what, a minute, and you're going to start to see some change. It's very, very, very simple. These, de these tables are a little bit low, but, these but you can even put your foot up here and still maintain decorum and still get some work done. In fact, give that a try. Don't fall over. It's so simple. We call this the couch stretch because it's perfectly done on the couch. It was built for a so you think you can dance, so that you could watch so you think you can dance. Put that knee to the back corner, squeeze your bum, and just try to open up that hip. How long do you do this to make any serious change? Two minutes. If something goes numb, what should you do? Call your doctor. No, stop doing that, right? That's easy. Don't, you know, that numbness is a serious issue. 
We've given you 10 different ways, 15 different games on there about taking a look at how to uh, kind of game this up. But remember that it's got to be about not being afraid to try to move a little bit at your desk, delaminate yourself, roll that ball around every conceivable place, on the, every, every soft tissue that you can have access to at work, create a game where you actually get something done at work for you, for your body, so that when you stand up, you become that supple leopard again, and you're right back out, and your desk hasn't imposed a compromise where you're playing gaso breco. Because that's ultimately what we need to do. We understand that, you know, if I was walking around like this all day long for my job, and then suddenly had to not be in this position, you know, it would be a, it would be a real problem for me. And that really is just a, a simple exaggeration of what this does. So whether you're standing or sitting, don't make the mistakes of losing the spine and my brace, two-hand rule, 20% on. And you can see everyone here. I don't know if you guys will you'll see each other and you'll walk right up, slap each other 20%. You'll see if that girl's overextended in the back. You'll see, I see you. Right? Neutral spine. And as soon as you do that, and then you've got this taken care of, get yourself organized. And once you're here, everything becomes very simple. External rotation and flexion, two-hand rule engaged, and get some work done. Make sense? Very, very simple. And I think now we're taking some questions. Nice to see you still sitting up and drinking water. Good job. So uh, please ask questions into the mic there. And then we have a few questions submitted to the uh, Google Moderator page. So I'm just going to leave this here. You can Great. read the question and okay. address it. Let's take questions from the audience first. Uh, I've had some problems uh, with deadlift in my, my lower back. I've been experimenting with different ab uh, position for deadlift. What do you suggest for, is it, is it this similar kind of two-hand rule for deadlift? So the, qu the question is, when I pick heavy things up off the ground, what do I do with my spine? That's really the question. Whether it's my two-year-old, my six-year-old, it's 500 pounds, it's the same thing. And the idea is, where should, I get, where should I get organized? Should I wait till I'm tight down here and get all organized and stiff? No. I do it at the top, where I get, not violate the two-hand rule, get as organized and stiff as I can, and then move from there. So we pr always prioritize the spine first, and then look to create torque at the hip second. So I would say absolutely getting organized. And whether you breathe into that tightness, do this little experiment for me. Take a huge breath. <gasps> Hold it. Now try to get tight. How's that working for you? It's like putting a bounce house into a duffel bag, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Now let's become cobras. Get tight. Now try to breathe into that tightness. <sighs> It's like putting air into a compressed tank. And that second model of stiffness and position first, and then breathing second. So your thing about the um, external uh, rotation, uh, like in having the mouse out, do you have any suggestions when you have to work a lot on a laptop where you got the trackpad in the middle to, to keep that going? So the question is, how do, you, how do you manage a compromise, right? You're playing Tetris with your body. And like, you know, you've got the perfect setup, you're about to get the space shuttle, and what's about to happen is like the worst piece comes down, right? And you've got to put that piece somewhere, and you're like, ah, oh, I don't know, it doesn't fit anywhere. Well, that's what's going on with that little mouse pad. You know, I'm pretty sure a wireless mouse is A, this large, right? So you can always make a better decision, which is my wife's best parenting advice, make a better decision to me, right? The second idea is that I can still be in an external rotated position and maintain the shoulder in a good organized position and then swing my hand in. And that's what's cool about having this extra joint. It allows me for some differentiation, <laughs> right? And that's, that's what you need to know. The main thing is to get the primary joint organized and then I can spin back in. But the second that misses, then I'm toast. But I've kind of gotten the habit of doing that. Do you have any good ideas of how to like remind yourself to get out of that bad habit then? So I do this all the time. <laughs> what should I not do? Not do this all the time. Yeah, that, just, you're gonna have to. You're gonna realize that you need to spend some time working on practicing, and uh, you know, there, the, we've given you some links and some resources to to encourage that. But just motor control and consciousness is pretty powerful stuff. Is internal uh, rotation ever good? Always good in extension. Ah, uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. So when the arm comes behind, it's the opposite. But that's beyond the scope today. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you still think about what are the principles I can control? What can I control? And then hold it there. And holding your little texting machine, you know. And if I can get my laptop up a little bit and not do all ten errors at once, my precious. Okay. Next question. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, minimalist footwear out there, like Five Fingers and Merrill makes some too. Thoughts on those as far as are they good for realigning everything or are they bad for the joints? I've seen kind of both thoughts out there. The question is, what do you think about minimalist footwear? I think it's awesome. Um, I personally, and I'll probably get sued for this, 
But um, I don't think my wife will go on a date with me if I wear five, frame, five and five fingers. So that's my fashion statement, comma, you can always make a good decision. In fact, our daughters went around in uh, ballet slippers. I think there's probably people here wearing very flat sandals. There's always a choice. Um, whatever shoe company that you're at, you, know, you're, you get a lot of input from your feet to the world. And if you're in a disorganized position or collapse or insulating yourself, you can't actually hear the messages from the ground up. And so do we encourage good mechanics first? Yeah, it's always solving the movement problem first. And if I have a $500 shoe and I'm putting my heel out to stop a $500 heel strike, then uh, it's a problem. I think there's even a correlation between the expense of your shoe and the severity of your knee injury. Convenient. Other questions? Do what works for you. All right, so here are a couple other questions. Standing appears to be a lot better for the body than sitting. What are the do's and don'ts when working on a standing desk, though? So this is the problem is that we think, hey, I'm, I'm an enlightened human being. I'm just going to stand now and do all the same things. In fact, I stand and my back hurts even worse because now I'm overextended all day long. And you'll know what I'm talking about. If you see these guys stand like this, oh, no, you didn't. This is me trying to not have my back hurt, and I stick my hip out. See what you're doing in the back? It's cute, right? But... It's not organized. That's right. That's the problem. And dancing, that's different. So one of the issues is, you know, how do I avoid that? And um, we'll see, you know, guys will stand out like this all the time. We see people will roll out on the bottom of their feet. And what they're all trying to do is solve that broken spinal position problem, you know, standing like this, putting your foot over. So the best thing you can do is at your workstation, give yourself a place to go. One of the, one of the concepts is your best position is probably your next position. So any one position is, you know, Han being frozen for a long time. That guy was stiff and dehydrated. But I'll tell you what, you know, if they'd allowed Han to refreeze, he probably could have hung out in that carbonite a lot longer without detrimental effects, without the blind sickness. And it makes a big difference because if I, even if I'm in a perfect position all day long, it turns out that the yogis knew they had to meditate in these very external rotate neutral positions, but then they had to stand up and prepare the body to be able to sit in those positions. And originally, you know, the breath training, the mindful training, the yoga, the movement practice was about being able to sit and organize. And that's what we need to be thinking about. What am I doing? And so now we've got at least a model or two or three models of rolling around on a ball and doing some, some hip mobility stuff. Does that make sense about that? And you know, standing all the is overrated too. But, uh, you know, this is a high position. You know, this is why everyone goes for these tables first at the little cafe. Next question is, is it better to work in one good position for the most of the day or mix it up? What's the good, what's the right answer? Mix it up, absolutely. Any recommendations on how to keep extra rotation in the shoulder arm when using a touch pad? You're a plant, that was great. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So start as best that you can, get as organized as efficiently as you can, make as few compromises, and then come back in. And what you'll notice is that it's not today that you'll see a change. It's a week from now, you know, a month from now, you'll be like, ah, I just feel great. This job is saving my life. And that's where we need to be going with this. Make sure we don't have any others. We do not see any of the exercises remotely. We only see the slides. Any way we could use the lacrosse ball exercises? Yes, on mobilitywad.com is our open source network idea about trying to put this out there. So you, you shouldn't have to pay for it. This should be, you know, you should come out of the womb when your, your mom hands you a, a lacrosse ball. It's all on there. And there's some uh, links on the back of these slides to those videos as well. Um, what, YouTube channel. It's all YouTube. Absolutely. Viva la YouTube. Um, we were just saying, we, I think we're up over 3 million uses on that thing, which is insane for stretching videos. Um, uh, I previously worked at a standing workstation. I found that after a while during my day, my feet would hurt. What would you do to avoid this plan, this, this problem? What do you do if you stand all day long and your feet hurt? That's right. Changing positions. I mean, but look what I could do at my standing workstation. There's this thing called stretching your calf all day long. You should have the most supple, long, sexy calves if you're standing up at your workstation because it's easy to get in there and open those up or get the foot up. And sometimes we see downstream problems where people get stiff and it's because their spines are disorganized. So whenever you're having any problem, ask yourself, is my spine in a good position or a bad position? Am I in a good position? Check. Am I, am I organized? Yes. And all these concepts, again, are out there. Yes, ma'am. Do you mind uh, talk about how we should walk? Do we go heel first? That's a, a big can of worms. Except it's not. R really, um, you know, the main thing is, how, you know, uh, let me say, 
if we have full normal motion and you watch a kid walk, it's absolutely heel first. You know, walking is, a, is not very, there's not a lot of flexion, not a lot of, the problem is, let me just make this clear, is that when I walk, I'm taking a, usually a very little stride and my foot is right up underneath my body. So the force that goes to the heel is transmitted underneath the base of the support, which is not so different than me falling forward and then just keeping my feet underneath me. That's actually how children run. And if you watch how children walk and initiate, you know, and you're like, Georgia, get over here. And she's like, sure, Dad. And then they run after you. And that's because that falling position is, is how we maintain this neutral spine. But what do I do? I'm like, no problem there. Right? And now I have to make all of these uh, cool walks. I had a girl's name as a kid. It's, that's how I developed the cool walk that hurt my back. So, you know, shorter steps. You know how gymnasts walk. They're nice and tightly and organized, and their feet are underneath them. Does that answer your question? What about running? Running? Um, you know, the best way to do for running is uh, are you pain-free? And what's the best and most efficient way? And we think the best and most efficient way to run is to put that ball of the foot on the ground, not heel strike first. But if you want to keep heel striking, I'll give you my physical therapy information. Running, is the most da- running with your heel down is the most dangerous sport in the entire world. And again, what's interesting about running is that we're like, oh, kids run, it's so cute. No one taught them to run. Running is a high skill, just like sitting. And there should be some thought to it. You know, we shouldn't take anything about the way we move for granted. You're welcome. Hi. Uh, should we be teaching our children how to sit? At what age? How? Great question. When should you teach your children how to sit? Go home and teach them how to sit. Now. As soon as they learn. You know, if I was a race car and my wheels pointed in different directions, would that be a problem for me? Is it a problem then if I walk with my wheels pointing in different directions? Absolutely. And what's happening is that that arch isn't supporting yourself. You're not walking. And the analogy is that we talk about it at home, about having our kids know that their feet go straight, and they walk with their feet straight. And, you know, it's an easy cue thing. And what does that look like to sit? Well, I'll tell you what all of the modern thinking about education is don't make kids sit all day long. That's the worst thing for them. And that having kids on the floor and having them adopt the positions where they're comfortable. And, you know, these kids are stuck in these positions. And you, you can imagine you had to suppress that urge and terror to like, get out of the desk, right? And then you learn to just muffle it down. And uh, once we kind of start this conversation, this is why gymnastics and some kind of system of movement and this consciousness is a big deal. Do you teach your kids how to go to sleep? Yes? Yep. <laughs> yeah, they have to learn that. You're going to go to sleep now and cry for five hours. That's okay. It'll be good for you. We teach them what to eat? Yeah, absolutely. And we should be teaching our children how to stand and walk and run. Absolutely. Thanks. You're welcome. Any other questions? Yeah, I got one other question. I saw uh, some of your videos, and I, I saw that you had to use some jump stretch bands to, like, look like pull some joints apart or something like that. What's the... What's the idea behind that, if I understood that? Definitely not necessarily pulling joints apart like a chicken. That's the wrong <laughs> message. Uh, one of the tools that we use all the time in the mobility wad is a big, thick jump stretch rubber band. It's like an inner tube tire. And the idea is that with that inner tube tire or that band, we can actually change and kind of encourage how the joint moves within the socket. So it's a, it's a kind of a more special motion, but what ends up happening is that if you're a you know, thick, strong you know, athlete with big hip capsules and you're powerful or you're just a, a human who's stiff, you know, stretching sometimes doesn't, doesn't affect all of the systems and in a system of systems. And by using that band, we can have a much better outcome. Our metric is if you can't see change, there's no change. It's very simple. It should be observable, measurable, and repeatable. And that's why we know it works, and that's why I'm standing here talking to you, because the things that you're doing should see change influence throughout your life. And if you can't observe it or track the data or see the changes, then it's, it's not working, and that's a pretty simple model. What about the neck? Um, what about the neck? Yeah, I tend to go like this for this. Yeah, how do I remind myself? Well, so with which the good question is how do I how do I remind myself of my neck? So my neck positioning. Well, this midline stabilization concept, the two hand rule, actually extends all the way down to the bottom of your sacrum and to the top of your head. And so if I'm in a good position, do you see how my head is still in neutral? And it's a continuation of my spine. And that when we pull Jonas up and we had his head go, in fact, the head is that keystone. His shoulders went, everything else went. And so if I can yell at my kid to sit up, sit up straight, instead of I just say, hey, you know, fix your, fix, are you tight or neutral or fix your head? And everything else fixes. 
So, you know, head in line, but again, there are a lot of people who only ever turn their neck when they drive and look in the back seat, right? And what we need is more of everything. You need motion. Motion is lotion. That's why we've got to tack and stretch. And so, we have lots of neck stretching or neck mobility ideas on the site. Um, from everything you've said, it sounds like you'd also be a fan of, of like the sort of the, the ball chairs and the chairs that move around for strengthening your core and things like that. Is that right or wrong? Or well, I think that all tools are tools. And so the problem with a ball chair, if I was sitting on a ball chair, and if you love your ball chair, stick with it. It's working for you. But what ends up happening is that people get on this unstable ball chair surface, and they're bouncing around, and they feel good, and then they get tired, and they have to stop that ball chair from bouncing around. And they do that by shutting off the circuit of their spine, and now they're in a flex position. Or more importantly, because you, you're an evolved person, you have a ball chair, you're like, bam! And now I'm overextended, and I've violated the two-hand rule from the front, and so now oh, I'm stable, good to go. No idea where my belly sticks out like this, though. It's strange. So I think all tools are good, and that, you know, staying on a ball. The physio ball revolution actually came from early in the uh, pediatrics uh, for physical therapy, working with kids with polio. And then they actually abandoned it because it didn't quite get what they wanted out of it. The reactive balance doesn't really transfer into other things. So if it, if it helps you to get through your day and it's another way to get some movement in there, it's a fantastic model. And, and it should be one more tool that allows you to you know, get out of your desk and thrive, not get out of your desk and you know, survive. Good. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate your time.